Uh, today I'm going to talk about metaprogramming in Groovy. And my name is Brian Sam Bowden. I am a software developer from uh, formerly from Columbus, Ohio, now from Scottsdale, Arizona. So I went from the snow to the desert. Um, still not used to the heat, so Bangalore is still too hot for me. So anybody here using Groovy today? Playing with Groovy? Just one, two. All right, we're gonna have to change that pretty soon. <laughs> uh, I started a small company in uh, Columbus, Ohio, back in 2000, and we have about 20 people. We're a small consulting firm. We do uh, a lot of Java, J2EE, Ruby, Groovy, Ruby on Rails, Grails. So I want to get started by introducing Groovy to you guys and just define what Groovy is. And uh, Groovy is a modern object-oriented dynamic language. There's, there's over 200 languages on the VM, the Java VM, and a few uh, dynamic languages like uh, JRuby, Groovy. There's even Lisp and Scheme dialects on the VM. Uh, but the difference between a lot of languages and Groovy is that Groovy was specifically designed for the Java VM, and it was specifically designed to make the transition from Java to Groovy very seamless. So when you look at Ruby code, it's going to look a lot like Java code, but without a lot of the fluff that we tend to put into Java code. So um, my good friend Scott Davis defines uh, Ruby at, as what Java would look like if it was designed in the 21st century. <laughs> but the good thing about Java, and, and the reason why Java is so popular, is it kept it backwards compatible for, for, for a long time, and they had a very uh, secure and restricted way to add features to the language. So that, that made Java evolve uh, in a very solid, streamlined fashion in, uh, in game popularity. But now it's time for uh, the new kids on the block, the, the new dynamic languages that can run on the VM to, uh, to be used for what they're really good. So like I mentioned before, Groovy syntax will feel like Java but without the clutter. So Groovy embraces and extends Java. You can use Java classes from Groovy. You can use Groovy classes from Java. Uh, most of the Java code, most Java code is valid Groovy code from the get-go. So if you take a Java class and you compile it with the Groovy compiler, you try to interact with it in Groovy, it would work just fine. So in uh, a lot of the things that we get use libraries in Java to, to deal with, Groovy has them built in. Every once in a while, I'm using strings, and I'm thinking, I wish the string class had a method called, you know, swap case or something like that. Well, Groovy has a lot of these things built in. So a uh, Groovy, uh, as opposed to a lot of dynamic methods in the VM, produces Java bytecode. So you can compile your, your Groovy code to bytecode in in uh, you know, obfuscate it, do whatever you need to do to the it uh, commercial. And a lot of the, the features that you find in most of the dynamic languages are, are in Ruby, like flexible type system. So uh, something uh, has a type uh, uh, when it's assigned, when a value is assigned to it, you have closure for a really uh, useful feature. Uh, anybody here done the swing development? Well, you guys remember, you know, anonymous inner listeners? That, that clutters your, your code and it, it makes it so ugly. And with closure, you can really clean up that type of code. Um, in the, the topic of today, of course, uh, uh, metaprogramming, which is what enables things like Rails, the, the web framework uh, built on Groovy, uh, uses metaprogramming everywhere to, to accomplish the, the magic that it does. Uh, managing collections is much simpler in Groovy, in uh, operator overloading, things that we used to have in, in, in C++ and then we lost in Java just because it was supposed to be simpler and safer. Uh, we now have them in Groovy, so we can do some of the things that, that are difficult to do a job today. So let's take a look at Groovy in action. <laughs> Icebreaker. So here's a Java class. Uh, this is your Java, not Groovy. And uh, it's, it's called Greeter. And this Greeter class has a green and a subject, uh, string fields. Uh, has a constructor, multiple argument constructor, and it has a, a method that concatenates the greeting and the subject being passed. Um, so fairly simple, getters and setters, all that stuff. So we're all used to this type of code, you know, a typical Java being Java Pojo. 
Now let's build the equivalent Ruby program. In, uh, in, in uh, Java, we tell, in the US at least, we call uh, Java beans, Pojos, plain old Java objects. And uh, some, somebody with a horrible sense of humor came up with that. Uh, I think it was Martin Fowler. But uh, so we have Pojos now in plain old Java interfaces, Pojai. And, and uh, now we have Pogos in Ruby. <laughs> So again, yeah, the, the, the naming is, even the naming Groovy, I don't quite agree with it, but hey. So uh, I'm also gonna add a main method to the class that I've shown you before. Go back. So I'm gonna add a main method to this class so I can test it. And in here I'm building a, uh, a greeter object called Good Morning Joe. And in the constructor I'm passing the greeting, which is Good Morning, and the subject, which is, which is Joe. So when I run this, I should be able to see good morning, Joe. And uh, this tool tip right here, I'm using a tool called TextMate, which is a text editor uh, for, the, for the Macintosh. And I can, when I do a, a Pro R or Apple R, my results are going to show up as tooltips. So throughout this presentation, you will see all the results as tooltips. So when I run uh, that, that uh, specific sample, I get good morning, Joe, as expected. So, what would you do to turn that Pogo into a Pogo? So in, uh, in Groovy, there's some principles, of course, I have to put a Pogo stick. Um, there's some principles that can guide you on changing a Java bean or a Pogo into a Pogo. So all classes are public by default. Uh, attributes are implicitly private. Semicolons are optional. And parentheses are optional, too. So uh, also, getters and setters are auto-generated. So you don't have to have a getter and a setter for each property. Uh, all you need to do is have the property. Uh, return statements are optional. So the last element in a method is what the return value is. You don't have to say return x. Whatever is the last thing evaluated in a method, that would be the return. And of course, uh, you can avoid all these string concatenation with g-strings. Uh, this is another horrible naming decision. And I did not find any images for that on purpose. <laughs> but I am, uh, never mind. <laughs> So um, and, and this comes from languages like Ruby, where you can embed values in a string and do the replacement of those values at runtime. So this is what my new um, Java class looks like now as a Ruby Pogo. So we have uh, a Ruby, uh, again, you can have package declaration, just like you would have in Java. And I have a class called Ruby uh, Reader. And I have my string read and stop, and notice no semicolons. Uh, and I have a method called read, which uses that G-string to replace the values in there. So in, uh, to execute it, I'm using the print line, which is a system.out print line, shortcut for that. I'm creating a new, new Ruby reader, and notice how I can pass the value to the constructor. So rather than having a constructor with specific parameters, I can pass parameters by name. And of course, then I'm, I'm calling the read method on that uh, specific focus. So, um, right. well, it, it does exactly the same. I don't think I need to run this example. It's very simple. <laughs> so, let's talk about some of the features in Groovy that make metaprogramming simple. And one of the things that, that every Groovy object has is a meta class. In the meta class, it's sort of like a. Uh, anybody use dynamic proxies in Java? Well, imagine it's sort of like a dynamic proxy where you can add methods at runtime. So the main class is not modified, but you have this meta class attached to your Groovy object where new methods and new definitions and overriding definitions that already exist can happen. So, of course, in Java, we all know that once you declare a class and you, you, you set it in stone, you can change the behavior of the class uh, after it's been instantiated. So uh, with Groovy's meta class, we, we have this proxy, this, this uh, bucket of new behavior that we can attach at runtime to the class. So that meta class intercepts uh, all the method calls from the class. So if I ask for a method, uh, Groovy will first look in the main Groovy class. And if it's not there, then it will ask the meta class. So let's look at an example of extending classes at runtime using Groovy. So let's say that I have a string representation of a Roman numeral. And I want to have a way to turn that into an integer. So 
So it would be very nice and idiomatic to Java or Java in the context of my specific application that is dealing with Roman numerals, if I could uh, find the integer value of that string doing something like this. So that would be really nice. Rather than have a utility that's called uh, Roman to integer and then having to instantiate that utility or, or use a static method to pass the value and all that stuff. So this is much cleaner and readable. And um, to accomplish this with Groovy, of course, out the box, this is going to fail. It's going to tell me, hey, there's no method called Roman as integer in this uh, string object. This is a string class in Groovy. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to attempt to modify one of the core classes for the context of my application. So how do I get uh, to do that? First, I'm going to enhance the class uh, because that meta class is always open. So I can do anything that I want to do to that meta class. And Groovy will look at that meta class first to see if I've overridden something that's the main, in the main Groovy uh, uh, Pogo, or if it's something new that I couldn't find in the Groovy Pogo. So let's teach the string class a new behavior. And one simple way to do that is to access the meta class of the string class and declare the Roman as integer uh, method. And of course, this is using a closure. So I'm using a closure. Uh, notice that there's an equal sign, and I'm declaring by by saying meta class the Roman as int. I'm about about to create a function pointer that is called Roman as int using a closure. And what I'm doing in here that this is just a skeleton of the uh, function. There's a, a whole bunch of switch statements in here. But what I'm doing in here it's now going through every uh, character in that string and evaluating them. And noticing here too that Groovy has very nice things like, like the, uh, the for loop. It's very simple here for every character in delegate. Now you might be asking yourself what that delegate class is. That's like the, the this object for the meta class. So the delegate here will be the instance of the string that I'm trying to uh, uh, work on. And notice that the return value is going to be that object uh, value at the bottom, that, that primitive uh, value. And again, you don't have to include the return uh, keyword in there to return a value for a specific function. So then to test it, I'm just going to do print line in my Roman numeral and call the Roman as int. So this, this method injection technique, what it, it uses, it's called something the expando meta class. And it's, it's sort of uh, uses the meta class in some other facilities to be able to expand a class at runtime easily. Now imagine the utility of this in a case, for example, where you have a Java class, a Java library, that you don't have the source code for. So imagine where, where, what you can do to enhance the usability of that class, or to even fix a bug. Let's say that there's a bug on a vendor jar, and you want to uh, modify that behavior. So you have two choices. If you use pure Java, you can do something like aspect J, and then uh, you know, do some sort of point cut, or, or an intercept, or before advice, or after advice, to change that behavior uh, from, from that vendor library. Or you can change and add your own method using Groovy, which is much simpler than having to have a, a new dialect like Aspect J, a new set of tools, a new compiler. So this uh, simplifies that type of uh, operation. So here's a full blown uh, listing for that Roman to end. And I know I have a bug in here. Uh, somewhere in there, for some specific set of numbers, it's not quite working. So I haven't even test, tested this very well. Uh, you know, I wrote this last night, <laughs> so uh, I, I will fix the bug eventually. But if I yes, you said there are two possible solutions. Can you use like a bug in this as an extension? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I could, I could, I could use uh, you know the, I, I could extend the class if I if I could do that. Uh, but sometimes they might be fine. So things like the final class are off limits to you in the Java world. But in the Groovy world, nope, you can go there and, because that final class gets instantiated as a Groovy object that's wrapping the Java object that also has the meta class attached to it, where you can intercept any method call and do whatever you need to do. So it, it, it is a little more flexible and also easier to use. But yeah, there's ways you can do it in Java. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've used dynamic proxies to solve problems like that too, but it's a much more cumbersome exercise than 
than using something simple like a dynamic language. So here's a big chunk of the uh, the Roman int method. And I noticed some of the things that, that are nice about Groovy. Um, so for example, I have my, uh, my, my way to iterate through each character in the delegate of the string. Uh, the case statements are the same, but notice I can get rid of all the semicolons. I still need my break statement so I don't fall through. Um, and uh, notice that my return value is just value. So let's run this and see what happens. And I put a comment there to, to you see what the value should be. And that, that uh, hit right there, 29, 25, is the result of running that code. So it was very simple to add a new behavior to an existing core class of the system. Now here's a little more uh, test, and these are all the ones that work. Of course, took out the ones that are <laughs> showing errors. But it, it's a very simple way to enhance something that somebody else wrote, or even um, dynamically create behaviors that might depend on user input. So um, you probably can hear a lot about domain specific languages. In, uh, in the Ruby camp, that's the flavor of the jaw today. Uh, everybody wants to do a DSL for some specific uh, API that might be too complex. And uh, in Groovy, in uh, Grails, which is the web framework for Groovy, we have a GORM, which is a DSL written in Groovy to simplify the usage of Hibernate. So uh, everybody here use Hibernate? or used it before. Okay, Hibernate is a really powerful tool. It's very flexible, enables you to do uh, OR mapping in ways that used to be you know, nearly impossible before. And, uh, but it's still a complex tool. You have to do uh, you know, XML uh, mappings, or you have to do annotations, and you have to figure out a lot of different things that are uh, usually outside of, the, of the, the world of the Java developer. So you have to learn all these different things. With that more, you can create a very simple connection between your, your objects, your domain model objects, in, in pure Ruby code, without having all the XML and all those things up there. And uh, Gorm creates methods dynamically, <coughs> so you can have, for example, finders. So let's say you have a client uh, object. You could uh, have a one to many relationship between a client and uh, accounts. Well, Gorm would dynamically, using Ruby's uh, meta class, dynamically add find uh, all accounts, find account by ID, find account by name. Those methods would appear magically. All you have to do is call them, rather than write DAOs. How many of you have spent many, many nights writing DAOs? So, yeah. <laughs> so here's another example uh, that of using the meta class to create uh, a DSL-like dialect for the integer class. So would it be nice to be able to do something like that seven days from now? So you can almost read it as, and that's a, the point of the DSL, you can almost read it and get what it is right away. So in this example, I'm creating this days from now method on the integer class, and I am uh, taking the number of days that they're passing and adding that to uh, the calendar with the current date, and then returning the time value. So if I run this, of course I ran this uh, sometime last night, I believe. So that's seven days from now, at what that was now. But again, DSLs uh, using metaprogramming, what, what they do is they, instead of moving, um, it, it's, you move the, the programming language closer to the problem. So the solution is more um, commonsensical. What you're doing, it makes sense in the context of the problem rather than having all these APIs to try to figure out uh, how to solve a specific problem. So uh, another feature that uh, Groovy has as a dynamic language is that code is data and data is code. So and, and that's one of the really useful features for creating dynamic uh, code on the fly. So in Groovy, you can do something like this. You can use the evaluate command and pass a valid piece of Ruby code, and that would be executed. So now imagine the things that you can do just with simple string concatenation. You can build specific methods and, and functions dynamically, and then you should evaluate and run them. So of course, if we run this simple example, uh, we're just gonna see a low world. 
But later on, I'll show you something more complex using the same principle. So here's an example uh, of using eval to do something a little more complex in dynamic. In this case, I'm creating a method called swap case. So if I have a string that has uppercase letters and lowercase letters, I'm going to reverse that order. And in here, notice again, I'm creating, I'm using the meta class to create a swap case method, and then I'm creating a string buffer, and I'm iterating through each one of the characters in the string. Remember that delegate, it's the, the, uh, the, the string instance that we're dealing with. And I am uh, changing things to uppercase and to lowercase as needed. Uh, this is a ternary operator, I just broke it down like that so I can fit it in the slide. But then to test this, I have a string that says Groovy Dooby Doo, and I'm creating a method uh, string, a string that's uh, called method, that has the value swap case. And notice I'm creating a command that in, uh, incorporates the target string S and the method, and then I'm evaluating that uh, command. So those, those are the kind of things that you can do with, uh, with this evaluation method. And of course, if I have that string groovy doo doo, I am going to yeah, it again. It's a little too fast for this one. I have to slow it down. But you can see that it did what I wanted it to do uh, without having to have a utility class, without having to have anything extraneous to the string class. What is the support standard? Say that again. It's so called standard and then it works. But you know, yeah, I mean, then there, of course, anything dynamic, if you use dynamic proxies, uh, it, it's going to have a performance benefit. Yeah, but you got it even slower than the regular cookie. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because eval basically is it, it's, it's taking that and having the, uh, the, the Ruby uh, parser parse it and then execute it. So, yeah, it, it, it's definitely going to be slower. Um, but sometimes that small performance penalty. It, it, you would, it would pay off in productivity. And what is the runtime of the Ruby code? The runtime of Ruby code? It's the Java VM. Yeah. And the doing the authoring time, what does it take to actually write this? Authoring time? I know that if you want to. <laughs> yeah. In, in this case, the, the editor that I'm using is called TextMate. It's a very simple editor for the Mac. I could have used, there's a plugins for Eclipse. You can use IntelliJ IDEA. You can use NetBeans. Uh, but this one is a very simple and, and a lightweight editor, so I didn't have to you know, bring up a full blown Eclipse to do something so what you mean? So a Ruby compiler. Okay. Well, if you want to take Ruby code into bytecode, because remember, all the code that I'm showing right now is interpreted. I'm interpreting the code on the fly, but you can turn Ruby code into bytecode. And for that, you need a Ruby compiler. So, so when you make changes to the other class for string, so it binds and shares things in different. It, yes, yeah. And if you use a standard meta class, that's a way to say that it's globally or locally. By default, it's global. So, but, but you can do it only in the scope of a specific method. Uh, let's say that I want to add a behavior right here. Let's say I have a library of behaviors that I can attach to my classes. I can enhance a class right here, use the behavior, and, and then that will only be for the scope of that method. Right? Yes. When I'm, let's say I'm shipping a library and I don't want it to be extended, uh, used to be in ways which I don't intend to be used, can I protect it? Well, uh, no, with Ruby. <laughs> with Ruby, I can, I can get in there and, and poke and, and, and pinch every part of that library. <laughs> um, and uh, so it, it, that, that boils down back to the concept of security by obscurity. So if you have a very solid API in a well designed API, Misuse of the API will probably be very little. Uh, if, of course, if you have a spaghetti code API where everything is exposed, uh, then most likely it will run into trouble. But, but again, uh, some of the fears of, of basically breaking into a class and doing things like that, of course, if you had a, a programmer that you know is going to get fired on Monday and he wants to add some crazy behavior on Friday, you know he'll probably be able to do it. But if, if that person uh, wanted to do that with regular Java, they'll probably do it too. So. <laughs> That, that security that, that private gives you, or the compiler gives you, it's a very faint sense of security. So unit tests, that would be the real way to prevent bad things from happening. Yes? 
but it's not just only for gold exceeding the gold. It could be like the library could make some security checks, maybe. So how does this fit along with the uh, security architect of Java the security claim? Because I, if, if my class does some checks, whether the user is be authorized to do it, and, and then there's a certain opposition. And if I extend it and remove that check, then yeah. I, I, and I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, but I am, I, I think I'm pretty sure that there's way to sandbox certain things. Um, Away from Ruby, but uh, could you use it to break the how to deploy that code? No, see, see, you have a library that has certain functions and implementation. The implementation could make certain assumptions about the 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 context that it is running. With a, with a language like Ruby, I can change that context. I can change. See, uh, two upper maybe a method like two upper, which I expect it. It's it's going to translate the code into upper string or whatever. If I change it to do something, it's a remove a file. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In malicious code like that, uh, people get the, the, the sense that, okay, it's a dynamic language, so they will, there will be, if the door's open, they're gonna be able to do whatever they want. Well, they, they, if they wanna do something malicious, they're gonna do it which, whichever level of security you have. Because it's a programmer in your team. But that's not possible in Java, right? Even if I, I mean, the framework by itself guarantees that you cannot transfer it to code. I, I've done things with SFJ that uh, you wouldn't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, there's always a way around that. Um, the, the philosophy of the dynamic languages is that, of course, we're all responsible developers. Uh, we're, we're not evil. <laughs> huh. Any .NET developers? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I know those guys are long gone. <laughs> but, um, but, but the difference is that with dynamic languages, you need a new level of discipline. In a new level, this is something that we still need in the regular Java world, but we never were forced to have. So we need to have very robust unit testing suites. Uh, we need to exercise test-driven development and test-first development, so we don't write ex excessive amount of code that nobody needs. So, so those areas will cause you more problems than having a dynamic language in there. Uh, the more code you have, uh, I, I, I run, uh, you know, code analysis, static code analysis tools that show a project having 40% dev code. And, and this is the tendency of a Java developer. Uh, I start writing something, and let's say, how many people have written a string utils for your code before? All right, yeah, don't raise your hand. You know, be proud, be proud. <laughs> but then, at the beginning, you needed like what two methods, maybe. But you said, you know what? I'm gonna enhance my string utilities class. You know, and spend like you know the next couple of weeks doing that, and that business function that they ask me to do, I'll take care of that later. But let me enhance this because we, we like to build frameworks. That, that's what we're all about. We're tool builders, but sometimes we actually are derailed by our ambitions to build more tools with more you know parts like Swiss Army knife. So unit testing, test driven development, test first development are the best tools to prevent malicious things happening in the code rather than. Than uh, you know, forego using the dynamic language because it can, you know, bypass something like private or, or binary. But let me talk a little bit more about metaprogramming. So uh, metaprogramming is about programs that write programs, and sometimes that sounds scary, like in the scenario that, that you showed. It. I mean, yeah, you can do a lot of bad things, uh, but there, there's ways to prevent that. In, in a solid architecture and design, would would stop most of those uh, type of attacks. I mean, you guys remember when? Uh, uh, you know, back in 1997, we used to let users you know, type like SQL in a HTML form. <laughs> I remember applications like that, where you know you would put they had a, a little text that said, "Well, here's a sample of what you can do," <laughs> and, then, and then of course all you have to do is select a user you know, password where you know user uh, equals one, and boom, here comes everything. So there's there's many ways um, that that we learn about how to how to. Uh, have systems that are dynamic but still safe. And one of the things that you really want to uh, uh, focus on uh, for metaprogramming is that it's a superb tool for building frameworks. And dynamic languages are much better for building frameworks than static languages. Static languages are really good for building APIs. But APIs try to solve usually pretty broad problems. So that's what happens with something like uh, Hibernate. Hibernate is a very solid API but it's so extensive that sometimes for a newcomer using Hibernate it takes a couple of weeks. You know, let me learn everything there is to know about uh, OR mapping first, and then I can use Hibernate. With something like GORM, like, that I mentioned before, in Grails, you can start using the framework right away. 
And um, again, uh, the topic of domain specific languages is going to come up over and over and over because really good frameworks try to do that, try to bring the, the, the code base closer to the problem. So, um, some of the reasons why Groovy is a really good uh, language for meta programming it's dynamic and reflexive, it's open and malleable. Uh, the code is data and the data is code, as I've shown you in those examples. It is a, has a cleaner syntax than Java. Uh, it's still not as clean as I would want it to be. I, I'm actually uh, more of a Ruby guy than a Ruby guy. But, uh, but it's still much cleaner syntax than, than what we have in Java. And uh, if you have a programming event model, so when things happen, when you add uh, something to a class, when you remove a method, when you add a method, when you override a method, you can listen to all those events and do things accordingly. So uh, I mentioned Rails a little bit. In, uh, Rails uses Ruby metaprogramming pretty much everywhere to accomplish all the magic that it does. And, and some of the lessons that you can learn from something like Rails or Ruby and Rails is that the productivity of web developers have gone way up just because of the way that the domain specific languages tailor the environment for the problem. So let's see an example of doing AOP the Groovy way. And this is a really, uh, let me tell you a story about uh, AOP in uh, IOC containers, aspect oriented uh, programming and inversion of control containers. <coughs> I was having a debate with a very well known Groovyist called uh, Jim Wire. And I was telling Jim, Jim, I'm trying to build something in, a, in Ruby and I need an IOC container and I need to have some way to do aspect oriented programming. And he told me, Poor son, you don't need any of those things in a dynamic language like Ruby. And I said, I think you're wrong. I've been doing Java for years, and I need to have an IOC container and something like Aspect J. Well, guess who was wrong? <laughs> so let me show you ways that you can use uh, uh, something like AOP in Ruby without having a different compiler, without having a different environment or a different set of tools. So in um, the main theme of aspect oriented programming is you have cross cutting concerns, things that, that apply uh, horizontally to your application that you don't want to pollute your business code with those uh, cross cutting concerns. So, the typical example is logging. Uh, but, but we've done all the things too with aspect oriented uh, uh, frameworks to deal with business logic. So, in Ruby, you have three types of advice before, after, and around. So when a method is being called, you can say, do this before the method is called, do this after the method is called, or wrap the whole execution of the method in this code. So of course, in Java, you will have something like aspect J. Uh, you have the compiler, uh, the foreign syntax. You know, aspect J kind of looks like Java, but then when you look closer, it's like, well, this is not quite Java. And of course, you need a special compiler now uh, to, to uh, compile your uh, aspects. So in Ruby, it's all built in, like any good dynamic language. So here's an example. Um, if you own the class, I should stop doing this. If you own the class that you uh, want to uh, apply aspects to, you can implement an interface called Ruby Interceptor. So in this case, I have a hello method in my foo class that just prints hello. And I have a filter method, uh, which could have been in any other class that I, that I happen to put it in this class. It's uh, that prints just filter. And now I have this invoke method, which is where I'm adding. Uh, invoke method is an implementation of that Ruby interceptable interface. And what I'm doing in here is passing the name and the argument. So every time a method is called, it's going to go through here first and then call the method. So what I'm doing in here is I'm saying uh, I'm outputting the method that they're trying to call, the, the method, method that I intercepted. And then if the method is different than filter, because I don't want to get in a recursive loop going filter, 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 forever, um, I am going to access the meta class object of foo and uh, get that specific method called filter and invoke it. Then I'm going to return the value of invoking the real method. So it's a pass through. So I am calling, so if I, if I instantiate foo and I call hello, it's going to come in here run the filter method, and then run hello. Uh, yes? Can I inject this interface using the meta class, or should I actually use yeah, it? Yeah, you can really, uh, but there's, there's an easier way to do that than using the interface. I'll show you that in a second. So this works well when you own the class that you're trying to uh, uh, find aspect on. And I'm not particularly fond of implementing an interface just to do a cross-cutting type of concern. So. 
So here's my class, I'm gonna run it now. I created a foo a variable that I call hello, and it says call to hello. Calls filtering and then running hello. So what we expect that happens. Now, so, so that Ruby interceptable interface works really well when you are the owner of the class that you want to deal with. Uh, but oh, if you don't have uh, access to that, you can use a meta class, invoke method. So here's the same example, but due to the invoke method. In this case, notice, even though it's in the same file, I'm assuming that I can touch this code. And I keep my, my pogo clean. So I have my class, is, uh, again, I could have taken this note or two and put it somewhere else. So I am uh, instantiating my class. I have, again, the same hello and filter methods. And then I'm using the meta class to create the invoke method uh, declaration, passes the name and the arguments. Uh, of course, I do the same check. I don't want to refer some filter. And then I grab the method target that they want me to run, and I invoke it. So again, this is typically what I do rather than using the, the uh, interface. So invoke method would be call on every call of any of the methods in this. Yes. Yeah. Is it possible to do it wrapping this one method around another method? Yeah, well the define method uh, it is sort of a global filter for the class. So any method invocation will stop there. Of course you can have a, a, a very simple way to check and say get out of here and continue what we're doing. Uh, yes. Is there any specific object calls and this other one? Yes, there's a, in, there's a, well, since you have control of this, you can call, I'm calling the method here, like uh, myself, so I can do this before and something after. I and mean, here, the order is it, it, up to you. You have total control of what happens in that method. You can even decide not to call the method that they wanted to call. I remember seeing something very similar to this in the Rails uh, application where you want yeah. to authenticate, check the event object. Yeah, before filter and after filter, yeah, I know. And, and, in Ruby, those things are implemented a little, in a little cleaner fashion. Uh, it, it's a little more verbose in, in, uh, in Ruby, but it's still a doable. And uh, Benkett's not here. Benkett's a Ruby guy, so my comment hit me with a bad <laughs> I like Ruby, but if I have a choice between Ruby and Ruby, I still prefer to, to go the Ruby way. But uh, so this invoke method, uh, um, method of the meta class object, it's useful when you're working with somebody else's code. But remember, you can also use this against Bojo's. You can use this against a class library that, that you don't have the source code. So let's say that your library is uh, calling some things and uh, you wanted to implement security around some of those method calls. Well, you could do something like this to, to slap whatever you know permissions uh, code that you want around. So the only way to do uh, dynamic method creation or dynamic behavior is to use method visit. And for those of you that have seen Ruby, Ruby also has method visit, so you know they, they Ruby and Ruby, they have been copying things from each other back and forth. Uh, in, in Ruby, for example, we have something called a uh, builder, uh, XML builder class, and that actually came from Ruby. Uh, and uh, so it, it's really good that the dynamic languages world, they keep on borrowing things from each other and making the, the old Python too. I mean, we have stole so many things from Python, it's not even funny, but never given credit, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> Any Python developers in the audience? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so method method is a way to uh, intercept any method call, and if the method doesn't exist, well, it's, it's a way to intercept calls to a method that doesn't exist, and then reacting to that fact that they're calling a method that doesn't exist. So here's an example. Um, I have a greeter class, and uh, the hello world thing just keeps on coming back. But in this uh, example, I have my greeter class, and notice here I have a Ruby hash. So this is uh, uh, like a hash map, and I have name value pairs. So I have a greetings for English, French, Dutch, and Spanish. And I also have a built-in method that knows how to greet you in uh, Navajo, which is a very ancient Native American language, using World War II to uh, greet the Japanese. But uh, so this class has a behavior that's built in, but also has uh, this collection of information that I'm going to use to create dynamic behaviors on the fly. So in my method missing class, uh, the method declaration, I am going to check first the name of the method that they're, they're, they're say, uh, 
of passive. And in here, I'm not doing any hard checking. I'm just assuming that they're going to call something that starts with say hello in. So after I get that, I want to take the last part of that method name to determine which language to use. And then I am getting the value of the greeting for that specific language. So you can start seeing the way that you can, instead of having one of these methods for each one of my languages, I could have this coming from the database, but have still the developers when they're writing their code, they're writing, the, they're calling methods that are coming from a database. So imagine the, the possibilities there. So this is the example of how I'm gonna run things. I'm creating the greeter and then it's calling say hello in Navajo, say hello in French, say hello in Dutch, and say hello in Spanish. I think I, I need to cut my movies after the output appears. But you can see that it's saying hello in all the different languages that I specify in that hash map. So it, it, this is one of those, those features that you can really use effectively at great frameworks. This is the way that Born creates dynamic uh, methods, dynamic finder for your classes sometimes. Um, so notice in here I have a, I'm calling a method that really exists, say hello and now, but then I'm calling methods that were never declared. But of course, since Groovy is interpreted, there's no compiler to tell me there's no method by that name. I'm just reacting to that invocation dynamically. So again, metaprogramming no longer for only the list and scheme guys. I came from doing PC scheme too uh, in a previous life. I actually did commercial PC scheme development. Um, so with metaprogramming, you can build a language towards a problem, which I've been saying all over the uh, the, uh, the talk, but the future of this is that all of our powerful Java APIs can be wrapped with Groovy to create really powerful frameworks and DSLs so they can be easier to use and we can raise the productivity of our teams. But will you do syntax this? What? Will you do syntax this? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so, well, th thank you very much. Uh, we have some books uh, available. If anybody do JBoss scene, we have uh, one of our uh, Employees that created a pretty good C book, and I wrote Beginning Pojos and Enterprise Java Development on a Budget, which is the longest title in the face of the planet. And it's about 600 pages, you could kill a small child with it. Uh, <laughs> if I were to buy one, I would buy one in a minute. Thank you.